Welcome to this lecture on the expected value framework for modeling employee churn with H2O. Hi, I'm Matt Dancho and I'm the founder of Business Science. We educate data scientists that are seeking to apply data science in business and finance. We teach students how to apply ROI-driven data science. This lecture is just a small sample from our new online course, Data Science for Business, DS4B 201. Here is a brief overview of the contents of this lecture. In this lecture, we'll explain what expected value is and why we need the expected value framework to help solve employee churn. We'll go over a simple example showing how it can be used to reduce the expected employee attrition costs by lowering overtime for employees. We'll then dive into a more sophisticated example showing how the expected value framework can be used for a classifier by adjusting the threshold. We'll explain this concept by targeting high-risk employees for overtime reduction rather than reducing overtime for everyone. We'll end with a discussion on two key subjects, threshold optimization and sensitivity analysis. Threshold optimization involves iteratively calculating an expected value by adjusting the threshold metrics of the classification model. This optimization process is critical for maximizing profitability or savings of a policy change. Sensitivity analysis enables us to adjust key parameters, reviewing their impact on the model. This is an iterative approach that enables understanding the potential ROI variability in the model. Expected value is a way of assigning a value to a decision using the probability of its occurrence. We can do this for almost any decision. The best way to understand expected value is to go through a quick example. We'll focus on a sales and marketing question, deciding whether or not to personally visit a customer that is interested in your company's product. Suppose you work for a company that manufactures high-tech equipment. Your company has received a quote for a project estimated at $1 million in gross profit. The downside is that your competition is preferred and 99% likely to get the award. A face-to-face -face meeting will cost your organization $5,000 for travel costs, time to develop a professional quotation, and time and materials involved in the sales meeting. Should you take the meeting or no-quote the project? This problem is an expected value problem. We can assign a value to the meeting. We know that the competition is 99% likely to win, but we still have a 1% shot. Is it worth it? Applying expected value, we multiply the probability of a win, which is 1%, by the profit of the win, which is $1 million. This total is $10,000. This is the expected benefit of the decision, excluding any cost. If our total spend for the face-to-face -face meeting and quotation process is $5,000, then it makes sense for us to take the meeting because it's lower than $10,000 or the expected benefit. When we begin to think this way, decisions become based on probability rather than intuition. Most people would probably tune out when they hear the competition is 99% likely to win. The astute business scientist, however, thinks differently. He or she wants to know what's the expected value with a 1% hit rate. Let's take this knowledge of expected value and apply it to our employee churn problem. Suppose we use our H2O model to generate predictions on new data. The class predictions for the probability of leaving are produced. We then run Lime and see that over time is consistently a top feature supporting churn. Putting two and two together, we develop a theory that a no overtime policy can help reduce churn costs to the organization. We then use our knowledge of expected value to generate expected churn costs, showing the organization ROI. In this lesson, we'll see how. We'll focus on three people. Bill, who is considering leaving and working a lot of overtime. Maggie, who is also working overtime but is in a management role and seems to like her job and Sarah, who loves her job but isn't working any overtime. Before we get started, there are two key terms to familiarize yourself with. The first is attrition cost. Attrition cost is the cost resulting primarily from lost productivity quantified as a function of salary, benefits, training time, and so on. 
The second is the policy change cost. The policy change cost is the cost associated with the reduction in overtime given as a percentage of attrition costs. Also note that all costs discussed in this lesson are annualized costs. The first is Bill. Bill is on the fence. He is working a lot of overtime, coded as yes in the data. He has a probability of quitting of 60%. We could reduce his overtime to see if it lowers his attrition risk. In doing so, we generate new H2O predictions with overtime toggled to no, and his probability drops to a 30% chance of quitting. However, there is a cost associated with the overtime reduction. It's estimated as 10% of Bill's attrition cost. Next is Maggie. Maggie enjoys her job, but she is pushing herself harder than she maybe should. She is working overtime, but seems to enjoy the thrill of the responsibility. We could reduce her overtime. In doing so, we generate new H2O predictions with overtime toggled to no, and her probability drops to a 3% chance of quitting. Again, there is a cost associated with the overtime reduction. It's estimated as 10% of Maggie's attrition cost. Last but not least, there's Sarah. Sarah enjoys her job, and it shows in her probability of quitting, which is 4%. She is not working any overtime, and therefore no changes are necessary. Let's look at a policy change to reduce overtime for everyone. We will model a mandatory no overtime policy. For the no overtime policy model, we can separate the savings calculation into three steps. The first calculation is the initial state, also known as the baseline. For our attrition problem, this is the expected cost of attrition for the organization with overtime included. In other words, no policy change being implemented. The second calculation is the new state. For our attrition problem, this is the expected cost of attrition after removing overtime for everyone, which is with the policy change being implemented. The third calculation is the savings. If the expected cost of the initial state is greater than the expected cost at the new state, the result is a savings. The first step is calculating the expected attrition cost of the initial state or the baseline. We do this by first tabulating the churn probability, cost of attrition, mainly from the loss of productivity if they were to leave, and the cost to keep the employee implementing any policy changes. In the baseline case, there is no policy change implemented, and therefore the expected cost is simply the cost of attrition multiplied by the churn probability. The total expected cost for the initial state is $89,000 for these three people. The second step is to calculate the expected cost for the new state, which is converting anyone with overtime to no overtime. Toggling overtime to no and generating new class probabilities of churn for the new state Bill's probability drops to 30% and Maggie's drops to 3%. There is no change for Sarah because she is not currently working overtime. However, there is now a cost of a policy change of $10,000 for Bill and $16,700 for Maggie, which is 10% of their attrition cost. The expected cost without overtime becomes the churn probability multiplied by the sum of the cost of attrition and the cost of the policy change plus the probability of staying, or 1 minus the churn probability, multiplied by the cost of the policy change. The total expected cost in this new state is $66,000 for these three employees. The third and final step is to calculate the difference between the two states. Calculating the difference, the total expected savings is $23,000. Keep in mind that this is just for three individuals. When totaled for hundreds of employees that leave annually, it can become a multi-million dollar annual savings. Now let's look at a policy change to reduce overtime for select employees identified with a high risk of leaving. This is a more sophisticated analysis which involves a special methodology called the expected value framework. The expected value framework is a way to apply expected value to a classification model. It enables us to combine the threshold, knowledge of the costs and benefits, and the confusion matrix converted to expected rates to account for the presence of false positives and false negatives. In other words, we can use the threshold 
to target high-risk employees and potentially gain even greater expected savings than an all-or-none approach. A side note, this approach is similar to using the gain and lift chart to hone in on high-flight risk individuals that we discussed in Chapter 5 on H2O performance. In mathematical terms, the expected value framework looks something like this, where the calculation combines the class probabilities, the expected rates, and the cost-benefit information. We can replace the mathematical expression with code, where the expected attrition cost is a function of the class probability, which are columns from the H2O prediction output, the expected rates, which are returned from the H2O.metric function and are a function of the threshold selected, the cost-benefit information, which are determined by the data scientist using knowledge of the business case. Let's step through each one of these individually. Class probabilities are nothing more than the probability of leaving and the probability of staying for each person. In our example, Bill's probability of leaving, or attrition equals yes, is 60%. His probability of staying is 1 minus the probability of leaving, or 40%. Maggie's probability of leaving is 15%, and her probability of staying is 85%, and Sarah's probability of leaving is 4%, and conversely, her probability of staying is 96%. These are generated by the h2o.predict function, which reports a class probability in the columns no and yes, which represent stay and leave, respectively. Next are the expected rates. The expected rates begin with the confusion matrix. A few key points on the confusion matrix. It tracks prediction error through false positives and false negatives. It varies by threshold, meaning as the threshold that defines a positive and negative is adjusted, the error totals change. We can use the h2o.confusion matrix function to get the confusion matrix for a given threshold. The confusion matrix results can be converted to expected rates through a process called normalization. What is happening is all of the actual no and actual yes values are grouped. The rates become the probability of determining correctly or incorrectly within the actual no and actual yes groups. The expected rates are then the probabilities of correctly predicting an actual value. With the threshold selected of 0.28 at the F1 maximum, the prediction algorithm is 91% likely to classify a no value correctly as no, and 9% likely to incorrectly classify a no value as yes. We can also see that the algorithm is 75% likely to calculate a yes value correctly as yes, and conversely 25% likely to classify a yes value as no. The key points are that the expected rates are error probabilities. They vary by threshold, and H2O makes it easy for us to get the rates by threshold using the h2o.metric function. The cost-benefit matrix is the final piece. We developed this using our intuition about the problem. This is the most difficult part because we need to apply critical thinking to the business problem and the methodology we intend to use when coding the problem. Let's take Maggie as an example. First, we'll look at the initial state. In this scenario, Maggie's probability of leaving is 15%, and she has a cost of attrition of $167,000. The cost of a policy change is zero because no policy change is implemented in the baseline case. There are four scenarios we need to account for with probabilities of their own. The cases of true positives and true negatives, when the algorithm predicts correctly, and the cases of false positives and false negatives, when the algorithm predicts incorrectly. The cost of each scenario is what we are concerned with. Going through a cost-benefit analysis, we can address each of these costs. First is true negatives. If Maggie stays, the cost associated with her staying is nothing. Second is true positives. If Maggie leaves, the cost associated with her leaving is $167,000, which is her attrition cost. Third is false positives. If Maggie was predicted to leave but actually stays, the cost associated with this scenario is nothing. We did not implement a policy change for the baseline, so we don't have any cost. Fourth is false negatives. If Maggie leaves but was predicted to stay, we lose her attrition cost. The expected cost associated with her leaving is 
Note that in this scenario, the cost of error due to false positives and negatives is the same as the cost associated with no error, meaning true positives and negatives. This may not always be the case depending on the business case and your methodology for analyzing the problem. Also for the calculation, note that the TPR and the FNR for the true positive rate and the false negative rate sum to 1, so they can be factored out of the expected cost calculation. Let's propose a new state, one that eliminates over time for Maggie. In this scenario, Maggie's probability of leaving drops to 3%. Her cost of attrition is the same, but now we are expecting a higher cost of policy change than we originally anticipated. The cost of policy change in this scenario is 20% of her attrition cost, meaning she's working approximately 20% overtime. Should we make the policy change? Like the initial state, there are four scenarios we need to account for with probabilities of their own. First is true negatives. If Maggie stays, the cost associated with her staying is 20% of her attrition cost, or $33,000. Second is true positives. If Maggie leaves, the cost associated with her leaving is $167,000, which is her attrition cost, plus the $33,000 policy change cost for reducing her overtime. This totals $200,000. Third is false positives. If Maggie was predicted to leave but actually stays, the cost associated with this scenario is $33,000 because she was targeted. Fourth is false negatives. If Maggie leaves but was predicted to stay, we lose her attrition cost plus the cost of targeting her, which totals $200,000. The expected cost is $38,000 for this scenario, an increase of $13,000 versus the baseline. Therefore, we should not reduce Maggie's overtime. There are three advantages to using the expected value framework for a churn problem like the HR employee attrition example. The first benefit of the expected value framework is that we can target by threshold for high risk employees. We can specifically hone in on employees like Bill that have high flight risk and low satisfaction while filtering out employees like Maggie that, although they work overtime, are low flight risk and have high satisfaction with their job. This enables greater expected savings than going with an all or none approach like the no overtime policy. The second main benefit is that we can perform optimization to find the threshold that maximizes the expected savings. By iteratively Calculating the savings generated at different thresholds, we can see which threshold optimizes the targeting approach. We can see in the threshold optimization results that the maximum savings occurs at a threshold of 0.149, which is 32% higher than the no overtime policy. The third benefit is that we can iteratively test model assumptions to understand the effect on expected savings. We do this through a sensitivity analysis. Here we test for a variety of average overtime percentage and net revenue per employee because our estimates for the future may be off. We can see in the profitability heat map that as long as the average overtime percentage is less than or equal to 25%, implementing a targeted overtime policy saves the organization money. If you're interested in learning ROI-driven data science, I recommend taking the next step with our new online course, Data Science for Business, DS4B 201. We'll teach you the entire process using the R programming language and cutting-edge tools like H2O Automated Machine Learning while solving a high-impact, real-world employee churn problem. Get started at university.business-science.io.